Live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, it's time for the Exit Exchange. Brought to you by XPX Atlanta. Dedicated to changing the trajectory of exit planning services in the Southeast. Now, here's your host. And hello again, everyone. I'm John Ray with Business Radio X, and you are listening to another edition of the Exit Exchange, and I'm here alongside David Shavzin and Bob Tanksley. David, Bob, welcome. Hey, John. Hey. Morning. Hey, morning. Uh, we we're closing out the year with a great show here, and we'll get to our guest here in just a second, but I want to remind everyone that the Exit Exchange is – brought to you by the uh, XPX Atlanta chapter of the Exit Planning Exchange. Uh, it's a local nonprofit association of diverse professional advisors who collaborate, keyword there, collaborate, to help their private client, uh, c- private company clients build business value, transfer ownership, and create a legacy of success in their lives and communities. For more information, go to XPX Atlanta. Dot org. And now I want to welcome Tony Hill and Tim Templeton. Tony and Tim are with Trivest. Tony, Tim, welcome. Good morning. Hi, John. Good to be here. Hey, it's great to have both of you. Let's talk about, uh, give everyone an introduction to Trivest. How are you serving folks out there? Well, Trivest is uh, uh, known as the, we're the oldest private equity firm in the Southeast. Uh, we're based in Miami. Our entire focus is working and partnering with family and founder-owned businesses all across the country. That's the one common denominator that we share with all of our our partners and investments. Um, We are very fortunate that we have a very deep team at Trivest. We focus in the lower middle market in all different industries, uh, except those that we're going to talk a little bit later on this morning that are more cyclical in nature. We like those companies that have a that are essential services and that kind of keep rolling through no matter what is happening in the market, the economy, pandemics, and otherwise. Uh, We're, again, very fortunate in the success we've had. We're probably among the most active PE firms in the country. We currently have 39 companies in our portfolio, um, and we've closed on, I believe, 41 deals this year, Tony. I mean, several in the past week. Uh, So we're trying to close out the year very strong. But again, our focus is working with those family and founder-owned businesses. They do things differently. That's how we operate. That's the culture we have at Trivest. Um, My brother actually is the managing partner at Trivest. He's been in that role for 20 years. And that, quite honestly, is how our father raised us. When you shake somebody's hand, that's more important than any contract. And that trickles all the way from uh, the partners all the way down to everybody in Trivest and through our portfolio companies. That's a great overview, Tim. I would just build on one specific point that you made around um, founder-friendly private equity and what that means. In its essence, it means that over the 40 years that we've been around, we have um, evolved a deal process and a deal structure, uh, specifically catering to family and founder-owned businesses. In other words, we have removed all of the nefarious pain points that you read about in the Wall Street Journal about business owners, um, you know, just in, in some of the uh, ethically dubious practices that they encounter when they work with PE. When you work with Trivest on day one, on the very first call that we have with them or meeting, uh, we show them a list of promises of all the things that we will not do to them, you know, as part of this dialogue to get a deal done. And then when we do close the deal, the structure that we use is one that's very balanced, very focused on legacy, very conservative, and very easy to understand. And in short, what does that boil down to? It just makes it very easy for family and founder-owned businesses who have not yet had that first injection of institutional capital to work with us. And that process, if I can just add, Tony, has uh, fortunately allowed us to be recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 50 uh, PE firms for founder-owned businesses uh, since they started this list three years ago. And we're actually only one of 14 firms across the country that have been on that list uh, each of the past three years. So that's something we're very proud of. That's that's fantastic. So I'm going to jump in and, um, you know, I, I look at this and it's, you know, it's easy to buy, right, buy 20, 30, 40 firms, but now we're going to start talking about COVID. 
and have you explain that. <laughs> so on that note, um, you know, we don't know where this is going. We keep saying, oh, it's behind us, right? Now we're into year two of trying to say it's behind us, and obviously it's not. Um, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on with where the virus is going and um, how that's going to impact you know, the, the, the world and certainly the business world. Um, from a capital standpoint, how much is going to be out there and what? how, how are you looking at it differently? And I'll you know, put it two ways for you. Um, when you're looking, have you changed, I guess, really? Have you changed how you're looking at and examining firms? And at the same time, you know, what should business owners be doing differently, right? They're usually not, often not ready in our experience uh, when we initially come across them. So how do you, just that, that world and what's changed for you with COVID and you're looking at businesses? I'll start with that one, Danny. <clears throat> yes, certainly COVID threw a curveball. Um, we are traditionally conservative by nature and the types of companies that we're looking to partner with. And again, that's staying away from uh, cyclical industries like real estate, new construction, uh, things like that. Um, and we like those essential services that typically aren't going to be affected by market conditions. Uh, but again, COVID threw a whole different dynamic to all of that. And like most businesses out in the uh, in the country of our company, our portfolio of about forty companies, you know, some took a hard hit, uh, a lot treaded water. And others accelerated and those excelled. And, uh, you know, what we're seeing right now for a lot of reasons, uh, we're in a, a very strong seller's market. And while there were companies that benefited from COVID, uh, they're trying to capitalize on that bump and uh, get a greater value for their company. Uh, likewise, those companies that got a hit, you know, there are some buyers that are trying to take advantage that those companies may not uh, be doing very well. We're looking for those companies that have been able to pivot uh, during that, uh, uh, that that COVID hit, uh, whether it's adding a new vertical, uh, looking at a new industry. I just visited a company north of Atlanta last week after uh, our social last week. And uh, in this particular company, uh, they were focused on four or five different industries where they provide their service. And they discovered there was a new one out there that seems to be now it's going to be one of their largest industries of generating revenue moving forward. Uh, so they were able to capitalize on that. Uh, but again, we're in a seller's market um, and, uh, uh, you know, people are trying to either take advantage one way or the other of what's happened in that. Uh, but we're continuing to go with our stride of those that are uh, going to be able to ride through different situations um, and be able to move forward. And Tony can probably, you know, expand on that some. Yeah, maybe I was going to just, Tony, do that. And and when Tim's talking about those that got the bump, you know, are you, what, you know, what examples, what industries, and are those bumps, are you looking at those bumps as permanent or at least midterm positive mm -hmm. and keeping, keeping that trend going? Or is this a 2020, 2021 bump? Yeah, sometimes it's a bump. You saw that in recreation you know, a lot of recreational uh, industries and businesses where everybody now is going outside and buying bikes and building swing sets and building pools and things like that. So how long is that going to last? We're not sure. Probably not continual year after year, but like the company I was just talking about, um, you know, they've added a whole new vertical to their company. Uh, so, you know, those are the kinds of things. So we, we need to evaluate that. Um, and then others are they, we've seen them as Tony will, you know, tell you have rebounded back to their 2019 numbers. And that's really what we're looking for. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing that's changed. Um, you know, I mean, I, I guess to take a step back, you know, one thing that has not changed yeah, is that, you know, in the heart of, you know, the pandemic in 2020, um, you know, when there were a lot more unknowns and unknown unknowns than there are today, you know, Trivus actually still had um, one of its best years in firm history. And in large part, that was because of the conservative nature of how we structure our deals and, you know, how we manage our portfolio companies. Um, you know, we don't over lever our businesses. That's a core tenet of the Trivest promise. And that made it a lot easier and faster for us to batten down the hatches, right? When some of our peers out there um, were struggling to, uh, to ensure that um, their portfolios had liquidity to ride out the storm. Uh, and, and we were able to, you know, 
this is not an exaggeration, within two to three weeks, we had everything tied down and we're able to resume, um, you know, something close to a normal operating posture. Now that was 2020. In 2021, I'd completely agree with Tim, right? I mean, I, I guess, firstly, I would say, you know, how we look at deals has changed, you know, like a lot of other companies, um, you know, necessity kind of being the mother of invention, or in this case, adoption. Um, we quickly pivoted to a hybrid model. We've embraced virtual technologies, and that's not going to change. I mean, we are now, um, I, I don't have a number in, in, in mind, but I can just tell you anecdotally that we are significantly more um, efficient in how we are uh, finding deals, engaging with business owners, doing a lot of things by Zoom that saves us time. Um, and it helps us push deal processes faster. Uh, and I think, look, one good example, going back to 2020, I'm kind of jumping back and forth in time here, is, um, you know, whereas a lot of PE firms were kind of just stuck for a while, we actually were able to close a major platform investment without ever meeting the business owner in person. Uh, and it's, it's a very exciting platform, by the way, and we're, you know, it's great to have them in the Trivis family. But going back to Tim's point, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing now, of course, is you know measuring COVID impact. And you know, it, 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 some bit, some industries were, were were of course found some incredible tailwinds. Um, you know, others got crushed. And you know, kind of figuring out you know which you know which trends are here to stay. You know, which are temporary. And again, also, as you pointed out, Tim, you know, kind of identifying, you know, which business owners maybe are kicking tires a little bit. They realize that their business is probably going to be at, at, you know, the largest peak they might see for the foreseeable future. And they're out there, um, and rightfully so, trying to see if they can, they can optimize a, a sale price. Um, and, and, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, untangling all that and, you know, bringing a lot of resources to bear to figure that out. Um, and then the last thing I, I would mention is that, you know, there are, um, you know, to, to David's point, you know, there are new risk categories that have emerged as a result of COVID. And, and you know, who knows how long these single event risks are going to be here. I mean, you know, anything related to supply chain, of course, is now a big part of a lot of deals we look at. Uh, who would have thought, you know, a couple of years ago that, you know, having just a, a U.S.-based supply chain could be a saving grace you know, uh, and today it is. If you're manufacturing in the U.S. or sourcing from U.S. manufacturers, you have a gargantuan leg up over you know your peers who are nearshoring or offshoring. You know, and similarly, you know businesses that rely heavily on unskilled labor. Um, you know, two years ago, not hard to fill those roles. Today, that, that represents a, a major new risk category. That again, who would have thunk it? you know, back in 2019. But yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different world, but we're navigating it like everybody else. Are, are there Inflation? Of, oh, sorry, just quick follow-up on about, uh, just really quickly, are there, you know, are there industries either in your portfolio or others or who, you know, like you say, are traditionally um, long-term, you know, very steady kinds of businesses that are dealing with either those supply chain issues or people issues right now? You know, what what in your portfolio is is hurting these days? And, you know, what do you see coming out? You know, is that, you know, yeah, get out the crystal ball. Uh, <laughs> you know, we are recording this, but, um, you know, what, what, what's, what's, what's hurting now? Well, um, I can tell you that uh, we are the largest franchisee of Massage Envy spas. So I'll let you guys take a wild guess, you know, which direction <laughs> that business moved in in 2020. <laughs> but, you know, we were, we were, we were able to uh, batten down the hatches there and ride it out. And, you know, that, that portfolio company is by far in terms of, you know, add on volume are most acquisitive. And, you know, we've, we've got the spigot turned on, on maximum right now. I think we've closed, gosh, at least five or 10 more add-ons for that, that business this year. So it's going well. And, you know, people are going back into spots and, and to your question, you know, I mean, a lot of all those businesses, all those, you know, hospitality slash, you know, travel slash experience related businesses that got obliterated, um, you know, we're, we're definitely seeing a comeback on those. You know, we're seeing, you know, renewed interest, you know, businesses that we could not, for example, have invested in last year, 
because of COVID and just, you know, just security around where that was going. And just the fact that you know, the numbers were so low, you know, we can't justify investing in a business if we don't have at least, you know, several months of trajectory to point at and say, hey, this company's coming back. You know, we can see a light at the end of the tunnel. We'll look fast forward a year. Now, companies that we had looked at last year and you know, we explained that to them, now they're coming back and saying, hey, look where we are now. You know, we're within striking distance of not only eclipsing, you know, our 29 uh, financials, but, you know, gosh, you know, business is great. You know, in a couple months, we're going to be, we're going to be above that. Um, you know, I think other, other spaces that, um, you know, another space that, you know, not to tip our hat too much, but another space that, you know, we're interested in is anything that involves, you know, um, you know, credentialing or skills uplift, you know, as we all know, the, 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 uh, traditional college framework, it's not, you know, I wouldn't call it wobbly. I mean, it's, it's there and it's, it's a key part of our social fabric, but there's no question that, um, especially related to, you know, some of these unskilled labor shortages that we have, a lot of people are looking to level up, you know, level up in skills, level up in pay. And so, you know, trade schools, technical schools, coding schools, you know, things where a small, a relatively small investment uh, in both time and capital can quickly lead you to a you know, whole new career track. But more importantly, like almost right off the bat, get you placed um, in a role where you're maybe doubling your salary. Uh, you know, a lot of demand for that. Um, and, and I'm sure you guys would agree just based on, on what we're all seeing out there um, on the labor front. So those are a couple of areas that, you know, we have renewed interest in. And um, yeah, the ones that are going down, of course, uh, anything related to PPE is, uh, you know, I think that that, that saw its heyday. Um, anything related to, you know, testing, screening, clinical trials. Um, you know, my personal favorite deals that I, I would snicker at a little bit when they'd cross our desk. And Tim, you, you pointed this out, you know, anything related to sports or enthusiast products or hobby products. Um, so we probably saw two dozen bike deals, two dozen canoe deals and 500, you know, paddleboard deals. And they were all, um, uh, let's just call the valuations very, uh, very interesting. Uh, and, and of course, sustainable. You know, the, the explosion, the year over year explosion in revenue was completely sustainable. This was going to go on into the future. What do you mean? Um, Everybody's going to be paddling to work uh, <laughs> eventually, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm still paddling to work. Uh, my so, sourdough, sourdough bread production. Yep, that, that's no, a yeah. good one. Yeah, there you go. Oh, we're, we're deep wow. in that. <laughs> go ahead, Bob. Sorry. Hey, uh, Tony, Tim, thanks. Um, getting a little bit more granular here uh, at XPX, we're often encouraging our uh, business owners that might be listening to this, uh, but especially our advisors to business owners that will be listening to this, to help owners uh, think more like a buyer. We, uh, we we encourage them to do that early and often. Uh, it makes the it often makes the transition a whole lot more smooth when uh, a, an owner who's someday going to be a seller can start thinking like a buyer. So when a buyer is uh, Presented with a firm like Trivest as a, uh, excuse me, when a seller is presented with a firm like Trivest as a potential buyer, what would, what would make it easier for you guys to say yes? This deal needs to be done. Whether you're injecting capital, taking a controlling interest or not, if it's a platform company, you're just an add-on. And answers could probably vary based on the scenario. But what would you guys like to see um, owners of many different types of companies do? to get that yes from you? Well, the standard response is obviously we want to see revenue and EBITDA going, you know, up and to the right, those kinds of things. Ideally, you have a stable management team. That's really what we're investing in at the end of the day. But the one question that Tony and I always like to ask a founder is, you know, what, what is your dream here? If we were to remove all the barriers in front of you, whether it's uh, uh, capital or a team or technology, whatever it is, if, if we remove those barriers away from you and allow you to achieve that goal, that dream you have in your head, what would that look like? Um, would it look like, uh, you know, adding on another, uh, you know, arm to your company, bringing in some more sales team, uh, focus on, uh, um, inorganic acquisitions, uh, 
we, we want to know that there is a, a company that's scalable and that we can help with our expertise accelerate that growth. Um, so I think that's what we're really looking for is, you know, what's your dream um, and can we help that be achievable? We want to look for the right partnership. And, and when I say partnership, you know, sometimes that means the founder continues to stay on. Uh, sometimes they leave the next day because that's what they want to do. And that's the luxury that Trivest brings to the table is we don't require founders and owners to stay involved. Uh, it should be their choice. Um, and so we can work forward, but we're looking for that, that growth and that scalability, I think is the primary uh, objective that we're looking for. So if somebody can come with a partial plan or an idea uh, that is realistic, we can make it happen. And I think there are a handful of just basic blocking and tackling type things that a business owner should do, you know, before they go into this first conversation, you know, serious conversation, let's call it, with a strategic or financial buyer. I mean, I mean, first and foremost, and I know this sounds like um, super obvious, but define your goal. <laughs> You'd be shocked at how many business owners we speak with who really aren't clear on whether they want to sell 100% of their business, sell 80%, get a minority you know, investment from a private equity firm, keep their kids on. That's the most important thing, knowing what do you want? And that makes our life a lot easier because it just makes it you know, easier for us to ascertain whether we can help. I think second is you know, knowing your financial story like the back of your hand. Because that's the very first thing we're going to ask about. You know, what happened in 2019? What happened with COVID? What happened during the last recession? Why did profitability drop 25% you know, three years ago? Understanding the ups and downs and being able to contextualize them, that's mission critical. We can't do that for them. You know, we can ask them about them, about those things. They have to give us the answers that explain what happened, and, um, and that makes it possible for us to continue our diligence. Preparing a growth story that's defensible um, and logical. I mean, I can't tell you the number of deals that Tim and I look at where it's a really good business, very profitable, consistent, great management. But we ask ourselves, how do we grow this? So coming in there with you know, a very viable growth strategy. And it doesn't have to be something they can do on their own. In fact, to be honest, some inside baseball, you know, we love it when a business owner says, hey, you know, I could quadruple the size of my business if I had a little bit of extra help here or if somebody was enabling me more on the HR front. That gets us excited because that tells we us hear that. that we hear that yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. I'm not surprised. Um, obviously, getting your documentation in a row, that's easy. You know, just make sure you have that stuff ready. Nothing. You know, time, time is the biggest killer of deals, as everybody on this call knows. So, you know, don't give a PE firm or even a strategic buyer, you know, more of a reason to lose interest. You know, try to get that stuff, you know, packed up and, and ready to, to share as soon as possible. And now I'm going to look at the flip side of the coin. And, and this next comment I'm going to make is near to and dear to my heart because it involves a, a deal that I personally sourced and was super excited about and it exploded. But rule number one about the things you don't do, right, to get a deal done is you do not, under any circumstances, <laughs> tell the world or your employees or anybody that you're considering doing this. Uh, I have seen this explode deals in glorious fashion <laughs> at the 11th hour. Uh, don't do it. Just, you know, I know it's a big deal, um, you know. Find someone else to help, but don't tell your company until you're right until it's the right time. Folks, we're here chatting. Yeah. We're here chatting with uh, Tony Hill, who you just heard from, and Tim Templeton, and they are with Trivest. Trivest is the oldest, the oldest. I love that uh, PE <laughs> firm in the southeast. Um, guys, I, I'm. I would love to hear a success story around the Trivest promise. So you list that, and we won't get into all the transactional pain points, but they're very interesting in terms of those pain points that PE founders typically get, uh, get thrust upon those, <laughs> those, uh, uh, founders of companies, I should say, and family owned businesses by PE firms. 
and you talk about how you avoid those pain points, talk about a, maybe a success story where you've come in to a situation and not required a lot of these onerous provisions. And that's worked out successfully both for the company and, and the, those uh, owners and for you. Yeah. So you could probably give a specific example better than I can. Yeah, sure. So I think let, let's just point at our, let's, let's point at Trivest's most monumental deal. So it was a company called uh, Down Hour Plumbing. Um, I want to say we made the investment in 2017. So this was a small family owned um, plumbing company in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, when we invested in the business, they had around 5 million of EBITDA. And the owners, like many business owners, were not, um, you know, they were they were not keen on having debt on the business, right? I mean, the vast majority of business owners have never borrowed money and they don't want to. It's just kind of a, it's in our DNA. Um, uh, so one of the reasons that, you know, Trivest was um, a very good partner for them was, well, there were a few, but the first was, you know, when we use leverage and we don't always use it. And when we do, we use industry minimum levels of it, right? So maybe 50% equity, 50% debt, but none of this, these crazy, you know, debt multiples that you see uh, other PE groups use that, sure, when if a deal works out, it's going to really tweak their return. But, you know, you're also introducing a lot of risk into the scenario um, and a lot of debt service. So we were able to, you know, come in with, um, I think, even lower, uh, a, a lower debt load than that. Um, we also... You know, they wanted to retain a big portion of the business, uh, and you know, I think more than average, we were happy to accommodate that. And you know, on top of that, you know, the strategy from the get-go, of course, was to, to do a consolidation strategy and roll up um, you know, other plumbing companies in the area. And also, we ex eventually expanded into an adjacent space, which was HVAC. And eventually, via acquisition, you know, we 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 went from a tiny little family-owned business in, in Lexington, Kentucky, to a reg regional behemoth known as the Turnpoint family of, of companies. And we sold that to Omer's um, last year at a fantastic, fantastic uh, outcome for everybody involved. But going back to you know what was important to the owners, they didn't want to be diluted. And uh, knowing that we were going to be going into this, this you know, aggressive roll-up strategy, and we were able to execute on, I want to say, 13 or 14 add-ons over the course of like I think three years. And because we didn't over the lever of the business up front and just because of, you know, our relationships and our experience, we were able to execute all those add-ons without diluting the, the, the family. And so when that second bite of the apple came around, um, you know, that family who had a gigantic piece of the business did phenomenally well. Uh, you know, they didn't have to assume any more risk than they, than they were comfortable with. And, um, you know, that is an outcome that, you know, I think was was very Trivest unique because not only you know do we work very hard to um, you know again to structure these fair and balanced deals, but value creation, which is something that we could have a whole other episode about, is you know our other stock and trade. Um, you know I think we probably have the largest portfolio support group in the lower mid market, and these guys are you know they, they are here to enable our entire portfolio, you know, via a number of tools and resources and partners to execute on these really audacious growth strategies. Uh, and I, I don't believe the term, the, the down hour family would have been able to, uh, to find a better partner to get them to the next level. And, and to expand on that, the promise that you brought up, John, and, and Bob is going to laugh at this because I always mention it. There are two things. Uh, there are several pain points that we removed during the transaction process and two of them I'll highlight and one of them is that we don't have earnouts in our in our contracts. So when we <laughs> see Bob's giving me the thumbs up. So uh, whenever we structure a deal, we're not going to tell a founder you've got to put twenty percent of it into an escrow and earn it back by meeting these certain benchmarks. As my brother has always said that when he went back and reviewed all the deals that we've been a part of, we've invested in the people, we've invested in their mission and their vision. And because we are aligned, we've always met those goals. So why hold somebody's money hostage? Uh, the other thing that we're not going to do is, is retrade our deals. We haven't done that in nearly 20 years, retrade a deal. When we sign a letter of intent, every deal that we've closed for the past 20 years has closed to the penny. 
And the important part about that, John, is that the most important part of a relationship is not the day of the transaction and the closing. It's the day afterwards when you're partnering and working together. That's when the real marriage begins. So we remove those, those obstacles and then founders realize and truly understand that we're all rowing in the same direction. We truly are partners moving forward. We didn't just take advantage of you the 11th hour before the closing and say, hey, listen, our due diligence came up with these three things. And now rather than giving you $27 million, we think it's only worth 25. What are you going to do? Uh, we call that the hosing at the closing. And a lot of our peers have that actually in their, their closing process. Step number six is, well, they don't call it hosing at the closing, they call it retrading. Uh, we remove those pain points. And that's what allows us to have the success with the Don Howers uh, that are in our portfolio. Well, we're running down on time, but I want to real briefly, because we've got business owners listening that may not be familiar with the term, t- uh, define retrading briefly, if you will. Talk about what so that is. Give the example. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the retrade is... Uh... Gosh, that's that's one of the most despicable PE practices out there. So um, the retrade is when at the 11th hour, right before you're supposed to close, uh, as Tim kind of illustrated earlier, PE group uh, suddenly um, shows up on a call and says, hey, we're really sorry, but something turned up in diligence and our investment committee can no longer sign off on the original terms of our offer. Uh, however, if you'd like to close on schedule, we can still do that so long as you're willing to take a small haircut. And that is sadly still something that happens out there because it's very effective. So we, you know, we, we banned the, the, not that we ever did it historically, but now it's just completely verboten. And, you know, we always close on the terms of our LOI period, full stop. Wow. That's important. That that's, <laughs> that's important. There's a reason there's a phrase out there, the hosing at the closing. Hey guys, uh, well, I didn't know until uh, right before we started the show here, when you've said that you are uh, Trivest is in four count them four of our XPX uh, network chapters. Didn't know that. I thought it was just two Atlanta and Miami. Why XPX? What do you guys see in there that, uh, that gets you excited as a firm and, and why do you support it so much? I know Tim is involved in our Atlanta chapter currently on membership. Yeah, Tony introduced me to XPX. I live in Tallahassee. Our firm is Miami and Atlanta is the closest spot for me. So I met Bob, John and David, you know, a year ago when I joined virtually. And to me, it wasn't really about just the networking. It was the collaboration that everybody talks about. And I quickly saw that not only was I meeting great people like the three of you and others, Uh, But I was learning a lot and not just about my industry, but about the people that we want to help. So it comes down to, you know, what decisions are people going to have to make that affect their estates, uh, taxes, um, their wills and all those things start coming into play. So I've learned a lot from my discussions in meetings that I am talking now with founders about, you know, it's not just about, hey, let's close on this dotted line and you know, let's have great success moving forward. But have you thought about what you're going to do when you, you finally take that step out the door? And everybody says, I'm just going to go enjoy my hobby, but they don't have a hobby. <laughs> and then they quickly realize that what they've been doing for 40 years is their identity and it defines who they are. Uh, so for me, it's been, uh, you know, such a, a great uh, organization uh, to where, as, as you mentioned, I now co-chair of the membership committee and trying to share the good word with everybody else out there to really help our business owners. Uh, like Bob said, you know, we've got to help prepare them for those exits uh, to make it not just a pop for them, but even more importantly, because Bob and I have run into this, you don't want somebody to shut down the doors uh, to leave money on the table, but more importantly, leave a lot of employees out of work. Um, so there, there, there's a big trickle effect here. Yeah, I mean, I, down in I'm, Miami. Yeah, so I'm in the Miami chapter, um, and Trivest is in I think four tri- uh, chapters total. And in fact, we're, we're speaking with Mary about trying to launch a chapter, possibly in Canada. But uh, there's a few things I really like about XPX. I like the decentralized nature of the organization. I like that each chapter has its own, um, I guess, its own style, its own personality. Uh, but that 
the chap that you guys go out of your way to host these these interchapter um, you know mixers, which I think are extremely uh, valuable for, for for me and everybody at Trives who does it. The caliber of the professionals is very high, but we really love the the, the mid market focus here, right? I mean, what, what's one of the big you know we all know we've all heard of ACG, and they throw some big events, and you know they're they're fine. Uh, but I think that the old saying that you're you're meeting the same exact people there year over year, and that they're all for the most part either the same PE groups and the same major investment banks, um, you know that's great and there's value in it. But one of the things that differentiates XPX for us is that um, it brings us way closer to the kinds of business owners that you know we want to engage with. And and, and by the way, taking a step back, the, the, the kinds of intermediaries and exit planning professionals that we want to have relationships because they have relationships with business owners. Um, but but it's just way closer to the core, uh, you know, audience that we're trying to do deals with and that we do do deals with. I think Don Hour was a great example. You know, it was a small family-owned plumbing business. That's not the kind of company we would have found via you know a different network. Uh, but uh, XPX has just proven to be an outstanding uh, collective. For the kinds of relationships that you know, we really focus on, and and you know, find great deals to work on from. Wow, great words from uh, Tony Hill, Tim Templeton of Trivest, uh, gentlemen. This has been great. Uh, what great work you do, and congratulations on your success. And we've got to get to the most important question, I think, at this point which is, uh, folks that uh, now hearing this would like to get in touch and learn more. Uh, whether they're uh, company uh, owners or intermediaries, how can how can folks get in touch and learn more? Well, certainly anybody can reach out to me. Uh, our contact information will be on on this podcast, um, or go to the Trivest website, trivest.com. Uh, it's very easy to find somebody who's willing to have a conversation at Trivest with any business owner that's looking to have a conversation about what opportunities and options there are available to them. Terrific. Tony Hill, Tim Templeton with Trivest. Gentlemen, thanks so much for coming on the Exit Exchange. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Thanks. Thanks, uh, gentlemen. Yeah. Hey, folks, just a uh, quick reminder. Uh, again, the show is uh, the Exit Exchange brought to you by XPX Atlanta. And XPX Atlanta is fundamentally changing the trajectory of exit planning services in the Southeast United States with values that include working collaboratively, putting the client first, thinking long-term, considering the human angle, and always be learning. If you'd like to know more about that, if you're a uh, an advisor, a, a intermediary that would like to be part of an organization like that and would like to learn more, go to xpxatlanta.org. David, Bob, another great show. Outstanding. Great way Thanks to wrap guys. up the year. Ab- yeah. Absolutely, it. Uh, I think we spiked the football and on twenty twenty one with these, <laughs> with Tony and Tim. So uh, uh, terrific, great, uh, great job. And uh, folks, again, uh, uh, thanks for listening. We appreciate your support. I am John Ray, and this is the Exit Exchange. Thanks again. <laughs>